You need winners? Let the sports advisor show you how to make money. General Manager Al DeMarco, a former sports reporter and contributor on Fox Sports, MSNBC, and Comcast Sports TV, brings over 25 years of handicapping experience to the table. Rick Torino, a 25-year handicapping expert, spent over a decade as a college and pro football editor at a national wire service. Together, they are the Sports Advisors, your number one source for winners. Well, the regular season is finally over, a season that started way back at the end of August. You remember those meaningless week zero games. We have reached the championship weekend, and we've got five games that we are going to break down for you. Hi, everyone. Al DeMarco here along with Rick Torino. Before we go any further, make sure you subscribe to the channel right down there in the bottom corner so you don't miss any future episodes. And, Rick, I've got to tell you, these five games are the ones that we like the most. And as usual, we never discuss which side we like. We just pick the games but we're doing everybody a favor because we're not going to talk about the ACC championship game between Clemson and North Carolina because we don't give a damn about that game. And we're going to start with a game that, well, we probably don't give a damn about either. And that's the big 10 championship between Michigan and Purdue. And I will say that we were really on the wrong side of Michigan, Ohio state last week. Yeah, what can you say? Us and, uh, and everybody else seemed to like Ohio State last week as well. But, uh, you know, Michigan really came out. Uh, they controlled the line of scrimmage, both sides of the line of scrimmage. And they just really uh, it, it put their force to uh, put the, put their will to Ohio State. It was that second half was just unbelievable. Um Ohio State's got to go back to the drawing board, I guess, now and, and try and figure it out again. But Michigan really looks to roll on Saturday against Purdue. I will say this. I'm glad it's Purdue. I was so glad Nebraska beat Iowa on Friday. Did not want to see Iowa in a repeat against Michigan. I think with this Purdue team, at least, Al, I think we can see it. We're going to see a little more offense. I think they can score a few points. They're not going to win. I don't think they're going to win, but I think they might hang around enough to maybe cover the game, keep it close. But at least I think with Aiden O'Connell, they should put some points on the board. Now, of course, we're shooting this uh, video on Tuesday night. And earlier today, it was announced that Aiden O'Connell would be starting the Purdue quarterback. He suffered a tragedy. His uh, older brother passed away uh, last week, but he is going to start despite, despite his brother's death. I will say this about the point spread, 16 and a half, obviously a big number. And for good reason, this game being played at Lucas Oil Stadium, in Indianapolis, as usual. You know, I look at what happened last year as a model of what will happen this year. And I know the past is not always indicative of what will happen to the future. But Michigan last year had the monster upset of Ohio State, finally broke that long losing streak against the Buckeyes. And what did they do? They took on Iowa, and as you alluded to, well, the Hawkeyes were just crushed 42-3. to So this year, they go into Ohio State. They win in Columbus for the first time in eight tries, and now they're taking on Purdue, and they're laying 16 and a half. I don't see anything different. I think that Harbaugh has this team playing so well. It's scary what Michigan did last week at Ohio State, considering that Blake Corum who we pointed out last week was not going to be healthy. We didn't think because we, of course, have doctorate degrees. And, um, you know, we went to medical school and clearly he wasn't. It was just a game of charades and he had two carries. But Donovan Edwards, who had missed the previous one and a half games with a hand injury, what a performance, 22 carries, 216 yards. And also what I liked is that J.J. McCarthy, a freshman, had – you know, what a coming out party in terms of a big game and a tough situation, a raucous crowd, 12 for 24, 263 yards and three touchdowns. So at this point, I don't see any way you can't play Michigan. Yeah, and you know what? Last week, Purdue uh, trailed Indiana last week. That game ended up 31-16, I think, but was probably a little closer. Um, You know, Indiana, Al, 421 yards of total offense. So if Indiana, and I think, uh, and 215 on the ground. So, I mean, if the Indiana offense did that to Purdue's defense, I mean, you can only imagine what Michigan's offense is going to do. And if Michigan gets ahead early, if they jump out uh, 7-10-0, 13, you know, it's – 
I, I just can't see Purdue coming back like that. The only way Purdue is if they get a lead, a uh, small lead of some sort, you know, get a couple of turnovers, but you know, it's only going to be only a matter of time until, you know, Michigan enforces their will on the Boilermakers. But I will say that I don't know about you, but I could care less about this game. I'm not going to watch this game of all the games on Saturday. I would probably watch a mid-American conference game, which says a lot considering how much I hate the Mac rather than watching this game. Just just saying. Before we go any further, and the next game is going to be an interesting game, the SEC Championship in Atlanta between Georgia and LSU. I've always been one to be all for total transparency. We talk about the winners. We've got to talk about the losers. And you finally lost a game on Saturday for only the second time this entire season, 10 and two now on Saturdays, this college football season. I mean, 10 out of 12, what the hell is wrong with you? I, I, I mean, you couldn't get, I, but last week I, you, I'll tell you what, when you go down in flames, you went down in flames big time. I will let you let everybody know what your play was last Saturday. Well, well, it was Vanderbilt, Al. <laughs> but you know what? At least it was buried early. You didn't have to stick around. There was no palm sweating. We knew by halftime, shut the game off, move on to something else because we were done at halftime, Al. Maybe done after the first quarter, the way that game looked. Yeah, totally disappointed with Vanderbilt. You know, a shot to play for a bowl game. Um, just just uh, Tennessee really showed they are the big brother in the state of Tennessee. But you know what, Al? You got to give credit to Tennessee. I mean, no letdown following the, you know, following the South Carolina loss. Five five players injured, no hand and hooker. Um, you know, they really just came out and, and, and dominated that game. So uh, I will say this, though. I do have a play Friday that's going to be one of our big ones. So Friday, look out. Jay, got to go to our site on Friday because there's going to be a big release on Friday. Hey, listen, I can tell you right now, you weren't the only one on Vandy. Everybody and their brother in the handicapping really? industry was uh... in love with Vanderbilt on uh, Saturday. But, you know, I agree with you. When you're going to lose, make it a mercy killing. It's like euthanasia. <laughs> Get it over with early so there's no worrying about waiting. Get it over with so you can watch another game. But listen, 10-2 <laughs> and two on Saturdays this season. You went on Saturdays. It sets the tone for the entire weekend because then you're playing with somebody else's money on Sunday and Monday, and that's what you've done. So props to you because nobody at – the site at the sportsadvisors.com has that come anywhere close to going 10 and two on Saturdays. So again, props to you for the college football season you've had. And that leads us to our next game, the SEC championship with Georgia 17 and a half point favorite against LSU in Atlanta. The big thing here is how the hell does LSU uh -huh. go to Texas A&M, a team that barely beat UMass the week prior lays the biggest egg of all in college football. As far as I'm concerned last Saturday, but not only do the Tigers lose, but Jaden Daniels ends up in the fourth quarter spraining his ankle. They say it's not a high ankle sprain, but bottom line, as of to yesterday, he's walking around with his foot in a walking boot. And we know that Jaden Daniels, early in the season when he was bothered by the lower back issue, by the knee sprain, wasn't the quarterback that was so electrifying as the season progressed, the guy that led them to the upset of Alabama, et cetera. You take away the mobility factor. Jaden Daniels is a good quarterback. He's not an electrifying quarterback. And that changes the whole dynamics of this game. Yeah, I'm looking at this game as thinking that Daniels is going to play. I heard a quote from uh, Brian Kelly saying that he'll be fine. Um, so I'm looking at it, uh, and I'm going to grab the points. I think LSU is going to bounce back. They have the athletes. This is a quarterback that Georgia does not like to play, a, 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 a multidimensional quarterback like Daniels. Uh, you know, as, as well as Georgia's played this year, they're still not, they still don't have a, any really big superstar on, on offense. You know, and I think Georgia's defense can, or LSU's defense can keep them in the game. Um, this is a series LSU's kind of dominated. They don't play that much with the conference split. Uh, LSU's won four to last five. The last time they met, they did meet in the 2019 title game. That was, of course, the, jo the uh, Joe Burrow LSU team that ran all over Georgia 37 to 10. So I'm going to grab the points, look for a, uh, uh, a different type of LSU team this Saturday night. Uh, to come out really inspired. I don't think they'll win the game, but I think they can keep it close enough to keep it close. And I got you got to keep an eye on number forty for LSU on defense, Harold Perkins. He he could be a difference in that game tonight, uh, Saturday night. Uh, 
you brought up a couple of interesting points, and I, I want to play devil's advocate and then also tell you why I might agree with you on taking the points here. Uh, first of all, listen, the dog has covered four of the last five in the SEC championship game, with the lone exception being Joe Burrow's Tigers, ironically. And the thing with Georgia, which you pointed out, is Georgia, you never know what you're going to get. Is this going to be the Georgia Bulldogs that played with maximum effort? Uh, against Tennessee, against Oregon, or is this going to be the Georgia Bulldogs team that skated by barely against Kent State, against Mizzou, looked lackluster against Georgia Tech, allowed Florida have that big second half comeback? You know, who knows? And the thing I want to throw out there to you, we all know this game, yes, Georgia needs to win, but this is not the important game. The next two games, theoretically, one and then two. Those are the big games. So the eye on the prize, one and two, down the road, not this game, right? I agree, Al, but you know, I think one of the goals that all these teams make at the start of the season is to win that conference championship. So I'm sure Georgia would like to win their second in a row. And I guess, Al, if we fail, let's face it, even if they lose, they're still going to be in the playoffs anyway. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think this is a big one for Georgia. I'm still going to stick around. I'm sure they'll have a LSU will have an enthusiastic crowd. I'm sure there'll be more Georgia fans since the games in Atlanta, but, uh, you know, I, I just feel LSU after that lackluster performance last week, I do not know how you lose at A&M as a 10 point favorite. Um, I think they're going to bounce back from that as so many teams do, you know, bounce back. I think they're going to bounce back and, and make a game out of it. Yeah, and you look at last year's game, I think Georgia was doubly motivated because Alabama was the opponent. We know all the side stories involving that. We don't have to redo history here or regurgitate it, and they won easily 41-24. to 24. But I'm still going to go with Georgia and lay the points because that defense, when it wants to, can wreak havoc. And I just have watched LSU too many times this season when Jaden Daniels is not 100% healthy, that offense is not going to roll as we saw it when it was at peak performance. The other thing you have to be careful, again, we're doing this on Tuesday night. Josh Williams, their leading ground gainer, 481 yards, 5.2 yards per carry, has missed the past two games because of a knee injury. Is he going to be available? So, again, not a game that I particularly care about, but I would go with Georgia. Rick is on LSU. The next one is the Mountain West Championship game. I think this one offers a unique betting uh, opportunity. Boise State at home on the Smurf turf, a three-point favorite against Fresno State. Uh, the first time around, it was a 40-20 win for Boise State. It was a game in which the Broncos outscored Fresno 20-3 in the second half. But Fresno State was without a number of their top players, including their starting quarterback. Yeah, you make a good point there. Sixth appearance for Boise State in the Mountain West Championship game. They do get it at home. I think the line's a little light. The way Boise State's been playing, and you brought this up a couple weeks ago when Dirk Cutter took over as their offensive coordinator, that team has really started to uh, uh, move the ball and really, you know, that offense is really generating um, two and two start. They got off to, and now they've ripped off eight wins in their last nine games. They had that 20 point win over Fresno and the quarterback, Taylor green uh, last week, 220 yards passing four touchdowns also rushed for 91 yards. Um, and he might've, yeah, I guess he did play because uh, by then Hank Bockelberger, the other quarterback uh, had already entered the portal, but I just think Boise at home um, laying the, laying a small number. I'm going to take Boise in this game. Listen, in the first go-round, uh, each of the Boise State running backs gained over 100 yards. Boise ran for 316, averaged 6.1 yards per carry. And that's really ultimately the key here because Fresno State's defense, they can't stop the run. They give up 159.7 yards per game on the ground. Boise State, uh, as you mentioned, has turned its season around because of the change in quarterback and the offensive philosophy. Now, Fresno comes in here having won seven straight. Jake Hayner, since he has come back because he missed a number of games early in the season, they have averaged in the last five games since he has returned to the starting lineup 39 points. And in that stretch, he has proven why he's one of the top quarterbacks in the country. 136 for 182, 1,500 yards, 13 touchdowns, only two interceptions. 
They've also got a good running back in Jordan Mims, who's number two in the Mountain West in rushing, over 1,000 yards and 14 touchdowns. But they just beat Wyoming this past Saturday, 30 to nothing. It was a walkover win, but they lost their defensive end, David Perales, who is their sack leader with 10 sacks, also 15 tackles for a loss. He suffered a sprained ankle in that game. Well, guess what? They're not commenting on the injuries. They, he may, Jeff Tefford said he may or he may not play. We've heard this story so many times. So you've got a defense that can't stop the run. you got the best uh, uh, pass rusher who may or may not play. I'm with you. I think you got to go with Boise State, and I agree. It is a, a light number. But how about the total? It's 54 points. I don't see it a, a defensive battle breaking out here. No, Ali, the other thing I wanted to mention, I did check the weather in Boise, and it's going to be a nice day in Boise. I mean, other times they've had that championship game there. They've they've played it in, in, in uh, winter, blizzard-like conditions. So 54 points, I would go with the over on that one, Al. Uh, the first one went over, what was it, 40 to 23? So 60, 65 points or 63 points, whatever it was. But, yeah, I like uh, the overs. A good sounds like a good play as well, Al, yeah. Yeah, 40, 20, 60 points on, in the first game. And that was without Fresno having their starting quarterback. So that's scary. And they scored 60 points. So that brings us to the next game. But before we get there, if you haven't taken advantage of this, and we've done 14 shows, guys, what the hell is your problem? The one day free. Oh. <laughs> hey, listen, I run the company. I can do whatever. I can say whatever I want to. Uh, the one day free all access pass is yours. Guys, if you're new to the site or new to the videos, what it means is this. You can go to the site on Saturday or any day you want. You can get Rick's Best Bet on Saturday or, again, any day you want. And all the handicappers for free, no strings attached. We're the only people in the business that have been doing it. We've been doing it for 21 years, and we do it for a reason. It gives you an opportunity to sample all the plays of all the handicappers for free. On Saturday, the normal price would be $109. Again, it's yours free. The only way you lose is if you don't check it out. So check it out again over at the sportsadvisors.com, the one day free all access pass. That brings us to the Conference USA Championship game between Tulane and Central Florida. Before we started doing this recording, it was announced that uh, Willie Fritz, who had been rumored to be the leading candidate to go to Georgia Tech to take over their football program, would be actually staying at Tulane as Georgia Tech decided to uh, go ahead and uh, promote from within. So I think that is a big motivational tool for the Green Wave. The other thing is Tulane is playing at home, and this is a huge revenge game for the Green Wave because – Central Florida beat them just a few weeks ago on their home field. Yeah, well, uh, Tulane, boy, they look good sa uh, sa Friday. For whatever day it was, Friday, I guess. They look good at Cincinnati, I'll tell you. That Ty G. Spears, another underrated running back that we've talked about this year. 35 carries, 181 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, a big motivational game that was for Tulane. Another one is they'll be making their first appearance in the AAC Championship, and they get it at home. Um, you know, and, and, and I don't know about South Central Florida last two weeks. They, they lost that game to Navy at home two weeks ago. Now, last week, they struggled against a very bad South Florida team, up 28 nothing Al. And then Plumlee got hurt in that game. Their good quarterback, John Rice Plumlee, got hurt, who up until that point had a great start, 133 yards rushing, two touchdowns, and was 9-for-9 nine nine passing. But the backups played this year. Mickey Keene, he's been in, so he let, you know, he had to get them back. They scored with 20 seconds left in the game. The kid made a fabulous catch at the goal line and fell in to the end zone, and that's how they won, but very fortunate to win that game. I think that uh, Tulane gets revenge, gets a conference victory, gets an AAC championship, and they'll move on in the, to play, and they'll be a, one of the six a group of six teams to play in the I, – I'm probably going to be in the Cotton Bowl. Um, as long as they can shut down, they're, they're going to have to key on Plumlee again because he did everything in that first game um, when the uh, – when uh, Central Florida played Tulane, he did, you know, he, he was their whole offense that game. So, uh, you know, they're going to have to be concerned about They're going to have to be concerned with him, shutting him down. Yeah. And the first meeting, which was 38, 31 with uh, Central Florida winning uh, in Tulane at Tulane, the Tulane defense just 
couldn't get any stops. They gave up 468 yards, 336 on the ground, as Central Florida averaged 6.2 yards per carry. They had a 10-minute advantage in terms of time of possession. And as you noted, Plumley was just outstanding in that game, both throwing the ball and running the ball. But he suffered the hamstring injury against South Florida, and that's why Mikey Keene had to come in. This is a guy who's not your typical backup either. He started 10 games last year as a freshman. He has played exceptionally well every time he's gotten the ball this year in relief or has started a game. So it's not like they lose a lot, but Plumley is the better runner, and that is going to be the difference here. Who knows if he's going to be available? That hamstring injury, it, you know, that's that's tough when you're a running quarterback. And I like the fact that Tulane, we liked them last week, that they went to Cincinnati and they pulled off the win, ending the Bearcats' 32-game winning streak at home. But little asterisk there, Cincinnati was without its starting quarterback as Ben Bryant, the senior transfer, was out with his own foot injury. So, you know, it, there are some outside influences, but I think the biggest one with the announcement that Fritz is going to return, that is huge for Tulane. In revenge, playing the championship game at home, minus three and a half, I'll buy down the half point as you will probably as well, and go with Tulane. And by the way, you mentioned something about Central Florida's loss at Navy. That was a shocking loss, as we've talked about in previous shows. That loss to Navy is the reason why Central Florida is not hosting this good game. Good point. And they got to play. That's yeah. a good That's, that's why this game is in now. New Orleans. Yep, that's a good yeah. point you make, Al. And Al, you know, you, you, you said one thing also. Um, with uh, Fitz staying, Willie Fitz staying, you know, on the other hand, you looked at it last week, you know, there had to be something going on with Luke Fickle in Wisconsin, because that's something that doesn't happen one day or two days. So there had to be talk leading up to that out and that kind of distraction, you know, and of course they went out and laid a clunker, same way the Lane Kiffin stuff with going to Auburn, another NC, you know, came out and that team looked so uninspired Thursday night against Mississippi State, you know, and like you say, all these factors come into place. Now Tulane can go out there, play with a clear mind and know that uh, the coach is going to be back next year or the extension, whatever he signed. But yeah, that, that, that you make a good point there. I'll give you another example. Look at how Liberty amidst the Hugh Freeze rumors over the past month ended the regular season with three straight losses. A Liberty team that prior to that went into Arkansas, won easily against the Razorbacks in SEC territory, and just collapsed like a cheap suit down the end. It's what makes the bowl season so unpredictable and so hard to handicap between coaches leaving, interim coaching staffs often made up of guys that were support assistants and had not even been on the regular coaching staff because staffs immediately go with the coaches that leave and abandon the programs and the new coaching staffs don't take over until after January 1 and players that immediately as we talked about last year decide to back out because they're seniors and they want to protect themselves for the draft or guys that want to enter the transfer portal early to get a head start to be plucked to go to some other team it's it, it's changed the whole way you have to look at the bowl games as opposed to when we did this three years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. You know, the bowl games still have that aura about them. But from a handicapping perspective, it's it's why you and I were discussing and I'll let the people in on it's why you and I were discussing the fact that. You know, doing bowl preview shows, a lot of people do them, but they're really worthless because to do a bowl show, we could sit here the minute the bowls are done and announce and we could do a bowl show, but there has no value in it. Yeah, I may do daily video reports and we might do a bowl show the last week of the season, but doing it in advance, there's no value because there's just so much uncertainty. Yeah, I agree with you. It's not like you said, like 10 years ago, we could do a bowl show and nothing will have changed. Coaches, players, but, you know, from day to day, you don't know who's playing and who's not playing because of, like you said, to save themselves for the NFL. I mean, when we were in the media, when we were writers, you know, the only thing you had to worry about then is, 
which guy got suspended because he was caught partying, broken curfew, or got smoke, you know, caught smoking a joint. I mean, you know, it's it's a different era nowadays. Anyway, let brings us that brings us to our last game, and I decided we should talk about this one last because it's a team that I don't think anybody I, I doubt there's anybody in this industry that has been following the TCU Horn Frogs like you and I have. From day one this season, we have been right on the money with our observations about them. We we really should be like honorary Horn Frogs. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but may, I should have worn a purple shirt. Uh, but anyway, uh, we got the Big 12 championship game in Arlington, TCU a two and a half point favorite against Kansas State. Both teams coming off Wins last week for Kansas State. Of course, it was far more meaningful after T- after Texas beat Baylor on Friday. Kansas State had to win, and they did get the job done. It wasn't pretty, but they got the job done against Kansas to advance. Uh, which way are you going to go in this one? Boy, Al, this is a tough one. This is, this is Al, going to be the best game Saturday at noon. Uh, here in the East, uh, noon kickoff. I just think, Al, it's going to be a dandy. Like you said, we followed TCU all season long. Um, all you heard last week was, I think TCU might have their hands full. That Iowa State defense is pretty good. It's tops in the Big 12. Yeah, it was tops to the put to the marching of 66 or 62 points. Yeah, um, you know, that offense is really good. But you know what, Al? I watched Kansas State Saturday. Boy, they are so physical. You know, that Deuce Vaughn's a great player. The quarterback, Will Howard, who made kind of made his debut against K- TCU in the earlier meeting when, the, when Adrian Martinez got hurt. He, you know, he's really come on to be a force uh, Al, this is a tough game you know you got max dugan you know he's going to be a heisman hopeful you know i think it's going already been decided the sc quarterback's going to get it but he should be in new york as one of the top five and, and that crowd in arlington is going to be crazy for both sides you know Al, i guess uh, i what the heck al we went they've been won us money all season long i gotta go with them again you know they're nine and two against the spread this season they've won five of our last six against the spread you know, I'm going to lean to the Horned Frogs again in a close game. But I think, you know, with the number being small, what is it, Al? Two, two and a half, I guess. So win by a field goal and we're a winner. They may just kick one in the last second to win 30, 20, 30 to 27, something like that, Al. It's going to be a good game. Well, I like TCU. I know a lot of people will say when these two met the first time, October 22nd in Fort Worth, by the way, Fort Worth and Arlington, you're talking about, you know, even with traffic, an hour drive. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, everybody will say, well, TCU was down. They were trailing at home 28 to 10. A little context. That was a stretch where TCU every week was playing like a great team and they survived. But I don't look at the point, the fact that they trailed 28 to 10. I look at the fact that Kansas State folded and TCU ran off the final 28 points of that game and dominated from that point thereafter and won 38 to 28. And I look what happened last week with Kansas State taking on Kansas at home. It was a game where Kansas State jumped out to the 23-7 win, uh, a lead after one quarter, and then suddenly it was 30 to 21 at the half. And eventually they did win. On the scoreboard, it looked convincing, 47-27. But this, is again, is a team that struggles somewhat defensively. And when you're giving me TCU in arguably a home game in Arlington, I'm going to go with the Horn Frogs in this one. You know, uh, Kendra Miller hasn't really been used a lot the last couple of weeks. Of course, two weeks ago against Baylor, he had to leave the game because of a little bit of a knee injury. But last week, only 15 carries because it was a blowout win. Uh, Quentin Johnson, one of the top receivers in the country, even though his numbers don't bear fruit because he's been in and out of the lineup. They rested him last week. He is just such a dynamic player. So I'm going to go with the Horn Frogs here, minus to two and a half. If the line moves up to three, I'm going to obviously buy down the half point. But, guys, clearly, if you agree with me, you bet the favorites early. You bet the dogs late. You bet TCU now. The other thing here, 61 and a half points, Rick, the total. Do you see a defensive battle here? I'll say this again, just like in the Fresno State-Boise game. I don't see this one being a low-scoring game. 
No, I agree with you, Al. There, there, points could be a plenty this one, Al. And I got to say, Al, TCU, the first big team, Big 12 team to finish undefeated since 1997 in Nebraska. And I know, Al, you got some connections in that part of the country. What do you think the crowd will be like for uh, TCU there since this will be their first appearance in the Big 12 championship? Oh, I, I, it's going to be huge because, again, if you if you look at the map geographically, I mean, Dallas, Fort Worth, Arlington, I mean, you know, it's it's going to be huge. And I realize Kansas State, there's going to be a lot of red there supporting the Wildcats, too. But TCU is at feel good story this year. And I, I want to see them win. I want to see yeah. them get in the college football playoff. This isn't Cincinnati last year. No. This is a much better team. And this is a dynamic team. I want to see TCU get in there. I want to see USC get in there. I don't want to see, you know, I'm tired of hearing Nick Saban already lobby about, hey, you know, we're good. We're a two-loss team. We should move in there. I don't want to see Ohio State get in there. I want to see Michigan kick Purdue's ass and move in there, too. And I I think, you know, that would be a really cool four-team playoff, you know, seeing Michigan, Georgia, USC, and TCU. That would be my hope because I think that you've got um, two interesting dynamics there. You would have two teams that – uh, are great defensively in Michigan and Georgia. And then you have two teams that can put some points on the board with TCU and USC. So you have the potential for some interesting games in terms of different styles. Yeah, I love it, Al, too. I'm usually a guy that kind of likes a, a fly in the ointment, but not this week, Al. I do not want to see Ohio State or any scent of Alabama near that top three or four team. No way. I, I, I'm hoping everything goes according to chalk this week and we get Michigan, which we will. I think even if they lose, out, which we – Pretty sure they're not going to lose. But at TCU and USC, want to see them both win, Al, and see them get in some new blood in there. Even though you could say USC, you know what? It's been a while. When was the last time the Pac-12 had a team? And I guess it was Oregon or Washington. Yeah. Probably Washington when I was in that Washington. CFP. Yeah. And, but it, it don't want any side of Alabama or Ohio State. And, and I feel the same way. I was so glad that Clemson lost last week because yeah. I don't have to see a subpar Clemson team get in there and have their ass kicked again. You know, right. so that's yeah. a, I, I'm with you to have USC and a TCU in there to break up the monotony and have some, as you said, fresh blood and have some different type of matchups. That's that's exciting because, uh, you know, the matchups, the styles make great matchups and that's that's what you're looking for rather than these blowout, ugly games and boring games. Oh, yeah. Same uh, old teams. Yeah. 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 Anyway, totally guys, agree. that'll do it. And, uh, you know, hey, it's another week down. Uh, we wish you well. And for Rick Torino, I am Al DeMarco. Remember to take advantage of the one day all access pass and more importantly, subscribe to the channel. And we might catch you as the bowl season progresses that last week of December when there's, I think, uh, at least 132 games. <laughs> we might be back to uh, break down a few of them for you. So good luck, everybody. And we'll catch you later this football season. Good luck, everybody.